Hey, this is Walter Schreifels from Quicksand, and you're listening to The New Scene. Hello, everybody, and welcome to The New Scene. I am your host, Keith, and we're back with another brand new episode. We've got another great show for you this week. We have Porcel, the man himself. He's in an excellent new band called Values Here. They have an excellent new record out called Take Your Time, I'll Be Waiting. And we are very familiar with everything else Porcel has done, or we should be. Youth of Today, Judge, Shelter, Project X, his yoga practice. We cover everything. The man is an institution, and we will hear his story shortly. But first, here's how you can support the new scene. Follow us on Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok at New Scene Pod. Follow me on Twitch at The New Scene. Shirts. We have shirts for sale at our store at Death Wish Inc. Pick one up. It's a great way to support the show. Reviews. We are in desperate need of Apple podcast reviews. We sit at 148. I am trying to get us over 200. And listen, 55% of our audience listens on Apple podcasts. We have to pump up these numbers. These are rookie numbers, and this is not a rookie show. Let's go. Let's do it. Open up the podcast app on your iPhone, search the news scene, scroll down, hit that five star button. And if you write a review, I'll read it at the end of the show in the news scene community hour. Also, don't forget to support Iodine Recordings, Horse Whip, Consume and Burn. The new LP is here and it is fantastic. Order it now, buy merch, listen to it. Listen to episode 199 of The New Scene that features Jeff from Horsewhip. That's a must-listen. The record is a must-listen. Let's do it. It's great stuff. Check it out. There's leftover Stretch Armstrong Tour merch, and that's available now in the Iodine store at Deathwish Inc., and there's limited quantities, so get it quickly. Dead Bars, Regulars LP, the second pressing is available right now. The Seattle Punk Quartet's latest record was produced by Jack Andino, and he worked with Nirvana, Soundgarden, Mudhoney. I mean, come on. His resume speaks for itself, and dead bars speak for themselves. Check out the record. Join the Iodine Noise Cult. Do you love the label? Do you find yourself purchasing all or most of their releases? Well, then you want to join the Iodine Noise Cult. If you join now, you'll get these records. Stretch Armstrong, A Revolution Transmission, Rebuilder, Local Support, Garrison, Orange Island, Split, Horsewhip, Consume and Burn, Garrison, A Mile in Cold Water, and Six Going on Seven, Self-Made Mess. You'll get free shipping. You'll get hand-numbered OB strips. Hmm? Huh? Think of the resale value. You didn't hear me say that. Okay. There's only 20 spots left. Space is limited. Join now. The Iron Roses have tour dates with Shoreline this December in Europe. Check out their page or the Iodine page for a full list of tour dates. And finally, Best X has two upcoming gigs. December 10th at Heaven Can Wait in New York City, and December 16th in Providence, Rhode Island at Alchemy. Also, don't forget to support this month's sponsor, Bridge nine records that's right bridge nine is back to sponsor us for the month of november here are some updates new york hardcore band incendiary device their debut album is out now it just came out november 10th pick up the vinyl at bridge nine.com and sign up for bridge nine's email list you'll get information about new releases exclusive in-store shows and events and promotions that go out to the email subscribers regularly. And check this out. For Thanksgiving weekend, including Black Friday and Small Business Saturday, that's November 23rd through the 26th, you'll get 20% off in the Bridge 9 web store. 
with the code new scene pod. Did you hear me? 20% off with code new scene pod. So if there's bridge nine stuff you've been waiting to pick up or holiday gifts you want to get, now is the time. 20% off. And listen, you can enjoy special deals at the Bridge Nine Record Store, which is located at 282 Rantoul Street in Beverly, Massachusetts. They've got exclusive Record Store Day releases, special vinyl variants pulled from the Bridge Nine Vault. There's new pressings available for Defeater, No Warning, Iron Chic. Those are available in store and online. So make sure you pick it up soon. And if you go to the store, you may even see creator of Bridge Nine himself, Chris Wren, at the store. And you can talk to him about his deep and passionate love of Philadelphia sports teams. For more information, head to bridge9.com or head to the Bridge Nine Instagram at Bridge Nine. That's Bridge N I N E. Okay. So listen, make sure you check back in with me. After the interview with Porcel, there's a lot going on. I went to the Quicksand Slip Anniversary Show last Sunday at Webster Hall. I saw Ecstatic Vision at St. Vitus. I saw Botch at Webster Hall. We'll do the New Scene Community Hour. I've got new feedback. I've got new messages. I've got new reviews. We'll catch up. We'll do everything. But right now, we are going to speak to Porcel of Values Here. Enjoy. All right. We are here now with Porcel. Porcel, welcome to the show. Thank you, brother. Honored to be here. Yes, it's great to have you here, Porcel. You know, I feel like I've been saying this a lot lately, but you might be the busiest man in music these days. I mean, look at everything we have. Values here, the new exciting band, Youth of Today, Judge, Shelter, Bold, Project X. You've done it all. And look, we're going to talk about a lot of that. But first, I want to ask you, how are you doing today? I am doing absolutely fantastic. I'm here in sunny California, and I've been teaching yoga here for two weeks. I've been practicing with all three bands, Judge, Youth of Today, and Values Here. <laughs> while I'm at- oh, wow. So I teach yoga by day, and then I practice, put on my hardcore hat at night and practice um, with all the bands. Um, Because Judge and Youth of Today are playing Furnace Fest, which is that big festival in uh, Alabama this weekend. Oh, they're both playing? Yeah. Oh, wow. So wait, is everybody in California to practice? Um, Our drummer wasn't, so he flew out. Okay. Do you find a confusing juxtaposition between teaching yoga during the day and then performing in hardcore bands at night? Yeah, it's a little weird. (laughs) (laughs) I used to do... uh, I remember one time I played... I did a, a, a like a four hour yoga workshop, and everything was very peaceful and Om and Shanti and all that stuff. And then I had to immediately leave that workshop and go play with uh, with Judge and Terror. <laughs> it's like, what is going? I like my mind is just doesn't know where to where to go. But uh, wow, you know it's uh, it, it's fine. It's it's my two passions. So. I love I love doing both of them, so I'm just kind of blessed that I get to do both of them. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So, you know, Values Here, I was pleasantly surprised when I heard this band because it was not quite what I was expecting. It has a perfect punk slash hardcore slash pop mix going on. I really like uh, I really like what I hear. Well, you know, it's funny because people will ju- will look at my past catalog or, you know, bands that I've done. And they may think, oh, this guy's Joe Hardcore. <laughs> you know, <laughs> yesterday, Judge, I was in Ball, I was in Gorilla Biscuits for a little while, sang for Project X. Um, but, you know, really, the music that I grew up on, which was like early punk, which was mostly like 70s, maybe early 80s punk, which was like, you know, the Sex Pistols, the Ramones, the Clash, X-Ray Specs, um, uh, Stiff Little Fingers, the Buzzcocks. Uh, the Jam, you know, all those kinds of bands, those were the bands that kind of shaped who I was as a person who loved music. And, you know, if you look at all those bands, all those bands, you know, back then they were considered punk, but, you know, there's a lot of melody to it. 
Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, and so that has always been part of me. And I think, you know, as I got older and, you know, started doing like shelter and stuff like that, you know, a lot of that started to shine through just my, you know, love for melodic music. I, I will always love fast, energetic music, you know, always like that's just the kind of music that is my kind of music. Um, but, you know, at the same time, I think it's really cool to try to inject a little harmony in there. And why not have a thrash song and throw some, uh, you know, throw some harmonies on there. And it's just kind of, yeah. it's kind of a cool juxtaposition, juxtaposition that, I, you know, that as a songwriter, I just love to play with that, with, with those kind of opposing elements, you could say. And it makes for interesting music. It certainly does. So I, I was reading about values here. You originally met the singer Chewy at a shelter show in Barcelona. When was that? Like around what year? That was right at the very end of 2019. That was probably oh. like December 2019. Uh, okay. And I I met her at that show. She she came up to me. Uh, you know, sometimes when I'm just like putting my stuff away, kids will come up and they'll be like, "Hey, man," you know, take a picture or whatever. And so she came up with, uh, with this guy who was her friend and he didn't speak any English, but he was kind of like, he was kind of um, a super fan. Like he loved it. He, he actually had a judge hammer tattoo. He had the youth of today fist and he also had the shelter wheel tattooed on him. <laughs> <laughs> Have you ever seen somebody with all three? I don't know if I've seen anybody with all three, but this, <laughs> this guy had all three. And so I was, I was kind of impressed. Um, but he didn't speak a word of English, but it was obvious like he really wanted to talk to me. He was, you know, he was, you know, loved all the bands that I was in and he just kind of wanted to, you know, just in a genuine way, just to kind of, you know, communicate some appreciation, I guess. So Chewy was there and she was acting as, as his interpreter because he didn't speak one word of English. And um, so I was kind of talking to this kid, but through her. And, uh, so we talked for, you know, he was asking me a bunch of questions and stuff like that. And then she said, Oh, I also love all your bands. Um, I'm also a musician and I'm a singer. And I was like, Oh, you're a singer. Wow. We should, I was like, I can tell you would be a good singer because this is the deal with Chewy. If you ever meet her, she's just one of those super charismatic people. You know what I mean? You just meet the person and, you know, right off the bat, they just kind of have a vibe that, you know, kind of pulls you in a little. Yeah, I could see that when I saw the album cover. She's on the album cover and I was like, OK. Yeah, she definitely has. She's definitely super charismatic. She's very friendly. She's just kind of like a likable person, you know, a uh, likable, mm -hmm. energetic person. So she said, oh, yeah, I, I'm in a band, too. And I was like, yeah, I could. She goes, I'm a singer. And I, could, I said to her, yeah, I bet you I bet you're a good singer. Like, I bet you're a good front person. I could just tell just from hanging out with you for 15 minutes. And she goes, yeah, we should. She goes. And I said, I joke, we should do a band. Um, and she was like, yeah, we should do a band. Oh, my God, we should do a band. <laughs> I was just joking. <laughs> but uh, she must have taken it really seriously because um, when I got right when we got off that tour, I immediately went to India on a yoga retreat. And so I was in India for over six weeks and she kept on, she, she would DM me on Instagram. Hey, we really should do a band. I, I think it would be an incredible band. If you have any songs that you've written that you never use, send them to me. I'll sing on them. You know, you can tell me if you, you know, uh, what you think. I really think I could do something, you know, really cool on some hardcore stuff. And so for six weeks, I'm in India and she's just constantly writing me. She was super determined. Um, were you like, uh, were you like turned off by that? Were you like, ah, I don't have time, you know, that I can't really deal with this right now. Well, I wanted to be, you know, I wanted to be nice because I genuinely, you know, liked her. I thought she was a, you know, cool person when I met her. But I, yeah. I really didn't have, yeah, I was thinking the same thing. I didn't, I didn't have, uh, I wasn't planning on doing a new band. And I was even saying stuff like, yeah, uh, I, I don't know if I want to do, do a new band. Um, if I do do some new recording, I'll probably do like a, a work on another shelter record. And she's like, well, if none of the, if the shelter songs don't work out or whatever, and you have extra songs, send them to me. And I, I, 
just let me sing on something and, you know, I think you'll be impressed or, you know, I, I, I think you'll like it. And I think we could, you know, do something really cool. Um, and then I got back the middle of February and it didn't take long for COVID. This was 2020. So it didn't take long. I think from the time I got back, two weeks later, the whole entire country and world was shut down. <laughs> right. You know, the weirdest thing in the world, you know, just everything shut down. All my, my, whole, all my yoga classes for the year got canceled. All our music got canceled. Man, we were supposed to play... Judge, Youth Today, and Shelter were all supposed to do a lot of touring that year. And all the tours were booked. And we're supposed to play these big festival shows. And everything got canceled. So I was just really, you know, just bummed about that. And just thinking, what am I going to do? Like, really, I was just sitting in my apartment. Just, you know, I'm not the type of person that likes to sit around. Same, yeah. And so to be locked in an apartment and like, uh, you know, can't even go out in the street. You know, can barely go to the supermarket. I was just at a loss, like what, and, and it was going on for months, you know, it, it didn't seem like there was any end inside. I was like, is this going to be like all year like this? And so Chewy being determined kept <laughs> on uh, emailing me and DMing me. And so I was thinking, and I was thinking, since I have nothing to do, let me send some tracks to this girl. And I, I had some, I had some songs that I recorded that never got used that, uh, um, I was playing in bold like maybe five or six years ago and we were going to do a whole nother album. And so we wrote a bunch of songs and we actually went to the studio and we demoed some stuff, but nothing really came of it. It's one of those things where, you know, you plan on doing a record, but it just never gets there. It's hard to write a record, you know? Yeah. So I had a couple of songs and I was like, let me dig out those old bold songs. I'm not doing anything, anything with them. I thought they were great songs. And I had them demoed without vocals, so I got them from an old hard drive, and I uh, sent them to Chewy. And I was like, hey, ch try this. And the first song that I sent her was the music to what became Will Be Tomorrow. And I'm not kidding. 48 hours later, I got the full track. Like, it was, a, it was, it was rough because it was a demo, but... It was the full thing of Will Be Tomorrow, all the vocals completely written, all the harmonies completely done. It just sounded like a rough version of what's on the record. And I tell you, when she sent me that, I wasn't really thinking much. And I just kind of pressed play on it. And I listened to it and I was like, this is incredible. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like she super impressed me. I was, I was thinking, how did she do this in 48 hours? Like write all the lyrics, write the melodies, write the harmonies. She was ready. Yeah, she was just, you know, she's, here's the thing about Chewy. She's wildly talented. She was born to be a musician. You know, some people are just, that's what they're born to do. You know, she's, she's grown up. She's had an incredible voice her whole life. Even when she was a kid, she was singing in all sorts of musicals and plays and stuff like that. And she tried to do some bands um, and nothing really panned out. And so you can imagine, like, here's a person who's like, imagine if you're really, really good at something and you just haven't gotten the opportunity to do that. You'd be so hungry to do that. So, so that's how she was. And I was really impressed. I, I sent her that song. That was the first song she sent back. And the next song was a song that actually got recorded by Bold, but it never got released. It was called Don't Bury Me. And that became uh, Bring Me the PMA. That was the second song that she did. And then we just, you know, I thought those songs were so great that I was like, man, we're onto something here. Let's just, I didn't have anything else to do. <laughs> I was sitting in my apartment. You know, I might as well. Now I was like, wow, great. Now I have not only something to do, but something like really, you know, that I can really just get into. And now I have the time, you know, I'm just inside all day. So I just started writing songs all day long. Like literally just all day, just working on this Value Sierra record. When you uh, use those Bold songs for Values here, did you ever hear from Bold? Are they like, hey, man, that's our record. We want to put that out or, or anything like that? No, because it never came out. And they were my songs. I, 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 wrote, I completely wrote them. The music, yeah. the music at least. Um, but Tim Bold is in the band, so those guys don't care. Oh, okay. No, nothing, nothing was going to happen with them anyway. They were just going to sit on a shelf. 
So it was just done. No chance of coming out. Yeah. I see. There was no bitter feelings over that or anything. That's good. Uh, Youth of Today. Now, you were in this band, Porcel. Are you aware of this? I am aware. I started the band. <laughs> you're you're still in the band. You're still in the band. It, we're playing again soon. I was researching about Youth of Today, and uh, it was an interesting fact I heard that when you guys got started, there was no straight edge scene. Like you would be the outliers when you went down to New York City to play CBGBs. Is this true? Yeah. See, that's interesting. Like, what what was going on down there? What like who? What bands were playing? And was like everybody getting fucked up? I'm talking like in the uh, you know mid '80s when you when you guys were getting started. I mean, this wasn't just New York City. This was the whole world. You know, Minor Threat had kind of you know people don't realize how short lived Minor Threat was. You know, they were only around for like a couple of years before they broke up. Um, yeah. And they had that song Straight Edge. They made it like a, a, you know, kind of a famous catchphrase in punk. Right. But they broke up very, very quickly and, and Straight Edge kind of died with them. Like you wouldn't go to sh- like, you know, in the mid 80s, you wouldn't go to a show and see anybody with an X on their hand. There was nobody that was Straight Edge. And Straight Edge was considered to be something that, Oh yeah, that was something Minor Threat did like a few years ago. It was like a footnote in in punk history, kind of. So when me and Ray Capo met, we really wanted to do a straight edge band, and it was it was it was very weird because we had this idea that we're going to get together with a bunch of people who are straight edge, and we're really going to kind of push this message because we we were straight edge, and we thought this is just a better way to live. Like, you know, you go to CBGB's and you see kids huffing glue and, you know, shooting heroin in the bathroom and it's dark. You see kids just throwing away their lives for, for absolutely no reason. So we thought this is a good message. You know, let's start a band and, and, and really sing about this. And it was, it was kind of a novel idea because even all the members of minor threat weren't straight edge. You know, they had, Oh really? Yeah. They had the song, but you know, the whole band wasn't straight edge. Oh, so we, I didn't even know that. Yeah. So we wanted to make it like a whole band and we're all straight edge. We all have X's on our hands and, you know, we're going to go out there and we're going to, and we're going to, you know, kind of, it, it was, it was also a strange thing in the scene at the time because nobody was playing really just fast, hardcore. Was it like more of a metallic thing happening yeah, at the time? It was when it was when metal first started coming into the scene, and you had like Agnostic Front. They put out the Cause for Alarm record, which is you know very very metal, and so a lot of bands were getting into that. A lot of bands were getting into like you know alternative rock stuff, and it just seemed like the hardcore that I grew up with, you know, negative approach, uh, Seven Seconds, uh, Agnostic Front. Uh, SSD control, you know, all, all of my favorite bands, nobody was really playing music like that anymore. So we got together, we got a bunch of other straightest guys in the band and we started this band. And at first it was rough because there was no straight edge. (laughs) There was, there had never been a straight edge scene, you know, like we're now there's a straight edge scene. Like if you today plays, We'll play anywhere in the world and there'll be a hundred kids, you know, hundreds of kids with X's on their hands and they're into straight edge and they come to the show. It wasn't like that. It, you know, there, no, there was little pockets of kids here and there that, that were straight edge, but it wasn't like a scene, you know, with, with a bunch of bands kind of championing these, you know, more positive ideas. How long did it take to start catching on? Well, when we first started touring, like when we the, the first time that we played C, Youth of Today played CBGBs with was with Agnostic Front. Yeah, we had only been a band for a few months, and we were and, and the guy that used to book the shows at CBGBs, his name was Johnny Stiff. And he was this famous kind of like hardcore character from you know the New York hardcore scene, and so we were backstage. We we're all putting X's on our hands, and he says, "Are you guys crazy?" <laughs> you're going to go out there to a bunch of people who are like drunk and stoned and high and sniffing glue. And you're going to come out with those X's on hand. He's like, dude, don't you understand? This is New York city. You're not going to make it out of this club alive. <laughs> <laughs> and we were just, and even I was just like, man, this is a little sketchy, but you know, got to plant that flag. <laughs> Take 
your life in your hands and flat the straight edge flag. Did anyone mess with you? Did you have to like fight or, you know, resist anybody? A lot of people hated it. Yeah. A lot of people were like actively, openly, violently against it. Yeah. And I'll tell you this. I have a theory and I think it's a sound theory. The only reason why we didn't get beat up at, you know, in the New York hardcore scene when Youth It's Today moved to, moved to New York City was um, we were really good friends with Agnostic Front. And, uh, you know, I used to hang out with Roger and Vinny and they were always super cool to me. Vinny Stigma at that show that we, Youth Today played, he let me borrow his amp. Um, so those guys were always really cool. And I remember at that show, since we were a new band and we had just moved to New York City, uh, Roger and Vinny kind of took us around. Hey, man, this is Ray and Purcell. They're in that band Youth Today. They're really cool. They're, they're cool guys. Like, they kind of gave us a stamp of approval. Yeah. And, you know, they're the kings of New York hardcore. Yeah, you know? yeah that's, a, that's a good theory. If I knew anyone who was friends with Agnostic Front, I would never say anything bad about them ever. Yeah, so I, I, I just think that because Agnostic Front kind of took our back and were just really cool to us and introduced us and made us feel welcome in the New York hardcore scene. Yeah. I think there, there probably would have been people that would have literally stabbed us <laughs> for being so, you know, outspokenly straight edge. But, yeah. Uh, yeah, it never happened. And I, I really have to thank Agnostic Front for that. How old were you when you guys moved to New York City? Uh, 18. Was that, that must have been crazy, right? Because New York, uh, mid to late 80s, uh, early 90s was still nuts. Oh my God, dude, you have no idea. Yeah. I'm living in the Lower East Side, you know, Spanish gangs everywhere. Um, it was dangerous, you know. Oh, yeah. Where, where in the Lower East Side? Because I hear like uh, epic stories of everything that was going on on like Avenue C and D and everything. Yeah, I lived right on Avenue A. Oh, wow. Avenue A and 11th Street. Yeah. I was right in the thick of things. <laughs> uh, you must have seen some interesting things every day. Oh, my God. I see so many... <laughs> I've seen so many fights, stabbings, people literally dying in front of my eyes. Like it was almost like the Wild West. It, it was, you know, the cops didn't even want to go down there. Yeah, you know, because it was just too dangerous. Somehow or other, I I don't know what it was because a lot of my friends were like mugged and beat up, and you know, a lot of crappy things happen to them but for some reason it just never happened to me yeah you know i've lived in some uh interesting neighborhoods too because that's what i could afford but i haven't been messed with a whole lot i don't know if it's because i have a resting angry face or what or because i'm tall but i didn't get messed with a lot only when uh only when i was doing nefarious things in nefarious neighborhoods would i run into trouble like that well you know that's another good point i think i saved uh, you know i I saved myself from a lot of trouble by being straight edge. Oh yeah, because most of the stuff where it, where things get really violent and ugly, they happen around alcohol or drugs or things like that. And I, oh yeah, that wasn't my scene. Like I was just, I wasn't going to bars. I wasn't, you know, uh, doing heroin in the park <laughs> like a lot of people were doing. Right. So it, you know, it. I didn't run in those circles where a lot of crazy stuff happened. Yeah, like the bad stuff that happened to me. I I was a uh, drug and alcohol guy for a long time, and now I'm a straight edge by necessity, as I say. So uh, the times I had trouble was in neighborhoods trying to buy drugs or, you know, I was drunk and someone noticed, so they robbed me, you know, like that type of stuff. Yeah, exactly. So, um, you know, I was, I've been straight, I've been straight edge since I was about 15 or 16 years old. Yeah. And it was probably the best decision I ever made. You know, it saved me from so much trouble and suffering and God knows what. Why did you make the decision to become straight edge? Did something specific happen or were you influenced by something? What was it? I don't know what it was. Um, th this is my theory. <laughs> You go through, you know, life is meant to learn lessons. You know, and, you know, this is like yoga philosophy. Like we're here 
not even necessarily like we're put on earth, not necessarily to like have a good time. We may have a good time, you know, but we're really put here to learn lessons. And, um, you know, according to yoga, it isn't just his lifetime. You learn lessons in this lifetime. And then based on the lessons you learn in this lifetime, you take birth again and you learn a whole new set of lessons. Or if you didn't learn the lesson, then you have to take birth again in a very, very similar situation to go through another life. So you try to learn whatever particular lesson your soul is working on at, in that lifetime. So here's my theory, you know, knowing what I know from yoga. For some reason, the lesson of there's no happiness through intoxication, there's only sadness and trouble. I think I kind of came into this world in this birth with that lesson. I'm not even kidding. Like I drank when I was like little, when I was like, you know, you know, in my high school in my junior high school, kids started drinking when they were like 10, like no joke. Oh, wow. I'm not even kidding. Like 10. Wow. Um, you know, I, I probably started drinking around like 12 or 13, but I never liked it. I was just trying to, you know, when you're 12 or 13, you're looking to kind of find your place in this pecking order of high school. You know what I mean? And I thought that I wouldn't be considered cool if I didn't drink and if I didn't go to parties and if I, you know, didn't do all this stuff. But I never, ever, ever liked it. I did it completely reluctantly. And I was just like, well, this is what I got to do or else I'm going to be a total nerd and nobody's going to like me. And, you know, you know, when you're a kid, those are the things that are important. You want, you, you want to find your tribe. You want to be liked by other people. So with that, with, in, with those naive intentions, I started partying and drinking and I didn't like it. I didn't like the feeling of being drunk. I didn't like being hung over. I knew it was poisoning my body. I knew it was wrecking my brain and wrecking my liver. And I didn't want that. And I always had this idea in my mind that I'm just going to give this stuff up. This is ridiculous. You know, like, why do I want to go out and feel peer pressure to pour a bunch of whiskey down my throat. And then the next morning I'm just like throwing up all morning and I'm hung over for the whole weekend. I was like, this is just dumb. <laughs> That's smart because I, I didn't like it either, but I kept going until I needed it. Yeah. A lot of people do that. It was a coping mechanism for a long time, but I'm out now. So it's all good. And you know, I really have to, I really have to give props to minor threat. Because although I was already kind of leaning towards being straight edge and not wanting to do drugs and party and stuff like that anymore, when I heard the song Straight Edge, you know, it just, it, it just grabbed me. Here's the thing about music that I love. I don't know if maybe you have the same experience with music, but this is what I love about music. You know, I'm a big Smiths fan. I love that band, The Smiths. And it's just amazing. Like, you're kind of feeling a, a certain way. Maybe you're feeling a little bummed out about something or a little insecure about something. You can't quite articulate it. And then Morrissey comes along with the Smiths and he writes a song and he completely articul articulates just how you feel, you know? And then you listen to that song and you identify with so much and you just think you feel good. You feel like there's another person out in the world that feels exactly the same way that I do. Like it, 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 it gives you some, like a sense of camaraderie and that you're not alone and it kind of validates the way that you feel. And music has done that for me my whole lifetime over and over and over again. So, you know, I didn't, no one was straight edge in my school. Everybody was partying. And uh, I heard that song straight edge. And that's exactly how I felt. I was like, man, there is a, I was like, this is exactly how I feel. I'm a person just like you, but I've got better things to do. Sit around and fuck my head, hang over with the living dead. Like that was exactly how I felt. And I felt like here's a person I've never met before, Ian Mackay. He felt the exact same way and he sang about it. And now I'm hearing it and it's striking such a chord in my heart. And that's really the magic of music. You know, when you can, when something really touches your heart like that, it really strikes a chord in you. That's one of the best feelings when you hear a song and someone just says something in such a perfect way that you 
could never say yourself. And even better when the music is just like so good and it's like you feel like it's something you would write or something you would want to write. And when those two things come together, I'm like, yes, this is this is it. This is the best. Exactly. Exactly. I think a lot of people that are real music fans have that same experience. Uh, but you know, so I, so I heard that song straight edge and it gave me the courage to go straight edge. Like, it, like I was thinking how brave of this guy, like here's some, like he was just a kid when he wrote that song. He was probably 18 when he wrote that song. And you know, it takes guts to go against the grain because everybody is partying and it takes guts to stand up and say, Hey, I'm not going to do this. I'm not into it. If you guys are into it, fine. But I'm going to stand up. I'm going to go in the opposite direction. And if you guys can't wrap your head around it, so be it. This is like my life, my path kind of thing. So I heard that song and it really gave me the courage to just like, I just told my friends, I'm not drinking anymore. And they're like, what? What's wrong with you? And I lost a lot of friends, you know, because party people want to hang out with other party people. But, oh, yeah. But luckily around that time, you know, when I was like 15, that's when I started going to shows. And that's when I met like a kind of new tribe of friends that were all har- hardcore kids. Um, and really, you know, that's what really, br- you know, brought me and Ray Capo together because I went to a show and I was straight edge and I put an X on my hand. Nobody put X's on their hands in like, you know, mid 80s. You just, you'd never see a person at a show with an X on their hand. And I walked into the club. I got there super early and there was Ray Capo. I'd never met him before, but he was sitting on a couch and he also had a big X on his hand. And I was like, I can't believe it. there's another straight edge kid here. And he's like, oh, well, he's, he's like my age. And so I went running up to him and I was like, oh my God, you're straight edge. And he was like, yeah. And I was like, oh, you got a skateboard. I got a skateboard too. He's like, yeah, let's go skate in the parking lot. And we just became instant friends because it was so rare to find another kid that was into straight edge. And that eventually kind of turned into youth today. And even, even values here, the whole band is straight edge. Is that a requirement if you're in a band or no? Um, Do you want the other members to be straight edge or does, does it depend? Uh, you know, with values here, it's not like, you know, all, the whole band is straight edge, but it's not like uh, we're like a straight edge band. You know, I, I don't want to pigeon, pigeon, uh, hole ourselves as something like that yeah uh it just kind of turned out that all the bands all the band members are straight edge but you know even at at this point in my life most of my friends are straight edge i've kind of made my tribe of people that i hang out hang out with people that don't drink people that don't smoke you know people that's you know are health conscious and so it just happens that all my friends are like that so when i was going through my circle of friends to get band members those guys were there. <laughs> <laughs> that makes sense. That makes sense. Yeah. Now, Judge, you are also in this band. Yeah. That's pretty crazy, right? Pretty crazy. So uh, in researching Judge, it seems like the band was started as a response to negativity to youth of today and the straight edge scene in general. Is that true? Yes. It was like, oh, you want to give us a hard time? You want militant straight edge? All right, well, we're really going to give it to you. Yeah? Exactly. <laughs> if you know Mike Judge, he's a very reactionary type person. <laughs> like yes. A confrontational type person. So Yeah, from, from you know, I watched uh, that noisy documentary. That was really good on the band. And just, just seeing everything about Mike and the mythology and the band, it was it was really interesting, but uh, like, what was your viewpoint on all of that? Were you into that whole like uh, confrontational straight edge thing? Were you were you into that at the time? Um, well, I did sing for the band Project X, and we had that song "Straight Edge Revenge." <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, in general, I'm in general, I'm not actually. I'm not into. I, I'm not into. Um, I, I don't think people's hearts are changed through shaming people or name calling people or like, you know, putting people down. Um, I think it just creates more division between people. Uh, so when judge started, we put out that first EP, it was good. And it, it was good. And it was bad. It was good in the sense that a lot of people that were straight edge loved the band, like loved the band. Um, but you know, people that weren't straight edge were turned off by the band. 
But I think that changed by the time the album came out. Like, um, you know, bringing it down is, uh, I mean, when we play, we have so many kids. It's, you know, it's not like Judge is just playing the straight edge kids. You know, no, that album, not anymore. That album kind of crossed over into like, uh, you know, just people that really love that kind of heavy hardcore, you know, regardless, they, they really like that. And I think at that point, the band, the, the focus of the band wasn't really on straight edge. I think at the beginning, it might have, it might have come across like that. But I think if you read the lyrics on Bringing It Down, I think Mike is just, he's a really great lyric writer, actually. And he's got a lot more to say than, you know, just I'm um, fed up. So the band kind of like matured, I think, and, and, and grew out of that initial kind of reaction to people that were haters on Straight Edge. Yeah, because uh, the, the last album, the last release, was that Bringing It Down, the last one? No, we put out an EP called uh, There Will Be Quiet after that, and that was our last record. Because I remember in the the documentary, Mike was saying, you know, everyone was getting all amped up about the straight edge thing, and there was a lot of violence, and uh, even like uh, types you don't want liking your music, like skinheads were getting into it. So he wrote, he started to write lyrics against all of that to say like, this isn't what I wanted, like, the, you know, the, it's it's got the wrong idea. Yeah, I don't know why skinheads love to judge. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I think- well, you know what I think it is, is like, uh, I, I think uh, hardcore just attracts broken people, you know, in whatever sense that they're broken. And unfortunately, some of those broken people that are attracted are racists or skinheads or, you know, whatever. Like, uh, I, I it, it's confusing to me. I know that people say there's non-racist skinheads or whatever, but like, you know, it, it attracts a lot of uh, broken types. Yeah, I mean, I can, I can relate to that because I think I was one of those broken types too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, uh, you know, that's that, that's the reason why Mike wrote the song "Bringing It Down" because when he saw that kind of skinhead element at our shows, which is cool. Like, I don't care if a person's a skinhead or not, but he wanted to kind of, to really make it known that hey, we're not racist. Like, yeah, we're speaking out against that. So he wrote the song "The Storm." And he wrote the song Bringing It Down, which were both like anti-racist songs. It's like, we're cool. Everybody's welcome at our shows if you're cool. But if you're going to come in here with your racist bullshit, then there's going to be problems. (laughs) Kind of. Right. Yeah. And you know what? People will attach, like if they like your band, they'll attach whatever meaning they want to it. Like there's right wing people who really like Rage Against the Machine and think Zach is singing about the things they care about you know, while realizing it's in complete antithesis to what they stand for. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. That is true. So uh, you guys recorded at Chung King Studios, and that uh, we ended up with that small pressing of Chung King Can Suck It, which is one of the most sought-after hardcore records. Do you have a copy of that? I don't. I wish I could sell it and be $10,000 richer. <laughs> 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 I was just curious if you actually have one. So what happened? Was it just a bad experience at the studio? Yeah, it was a terrible experience at the studio. The the um, engineer was doing coke. You know, we had to really rush it. They gave us a time slot. Of, you know, that's a, that's like a famous hip hop studio. Yeah. LL Cool J was recording at the time. The Beastie Boys were recording there at the time. Uh, Public Enemy was recording. So when a band judge comes to record, they give us the worst room, the worst time slot. You know, we're recording from like two in the morning to like, you know, 10 in the morning or something like that. And it just didn't, you know, we just didn't like how it came out. It, it was uninspiring. Like I said, the engineer was just like doing coke underneath the board the whole time. And he was just coked out of his mind. Oh. And it didn't turn out good. How did you guys end up there? Uh, the bass player for Murphy's Law worked there. And so some hardcore bands started recording there. Like Youth of Today recorded We're Not Us Alone there. I don't know. It's, I don't know how we ended up there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because it, it just doesn't seem like the right fit. I was wondering about that. Um, Danzig recorded his first record there. So it's it was starting to open up to like punk and rock kind of music. And so we decided we were going to roll. I mean, 
it's an incredible, like the, you know, the, uh, the, the, the equipment is incredible. I mean, it's like yeah. a top rated, you know, studio. So we thought, well, if we go there and we're, and we're using really good equipment, we're going to get this amazing recording. But if nobody cares about you behind the board, then you're not going to get the incredible recording. So it was, it wasn't good. And, uh, when the band ended and Mike disappeared, did you, did you talk to him at all? Like, did you know where he was or, you know, like what was the story there? I had no idea. I didn't talk to him. I didn't know what he was doing. He kind of dropped off, dropped out of the scene, never went to shows. You know, and I would hear rumors. Oh, yeah. Did you hear Mike is in a, you know, motorcycle gang and all this stuff? Yeah. And he's riding around with a cop's head on his motorcycle. Like when you heard these rumors, did you say to people like, no, or did I mean, like, what, what was your reaction to that stuff? I had no idea. If it, was true, if it was true or not. No one might. It could have, it could have easily been true. <laughs> how long, how many years went by before you heard from him again? Wow. Probably 10 years. Really? Yeah. When did you hear from him again? How? Uh, the first time that I saw him was I was going to do a, I was working with actually the same guy, this guy, this guy, Joseph Patasol, who, directed the, uh, both those values here videos. Yeah. Um, we were working on a documentary for revelation on all the revelation bands and it was going to be like a little, you know, movie. Yeah. And so somehow or other revelation had gotten in touch with Mike and they said, Hey, can you be in this, in this movie? Um, Purcell's doing all the interviews and Mike said, yes. And so I met him in Thompson Square Park in, in New York City, and he did the interview. Unfortunately, that's another weird thing that never came out. <laughs> <laughs> it's so much work to that day. He interviewed a million bands. It just never came out. Like, I don't know what happened to it. But uh, that was the first time I saw Mike. Wow. Was it weird at all? Were you like, hey, where have you been? What have you been doing? Um, it wasn't that weird, but he didn't have a lot of time. Yeah. So we just kind of did the interview and then I, you know, gave him a, a hug and, you know, he just kind of left. I didn't really get to talk to him like, hey, what have you been doing for the past 10 years? But it wasn't really until Judge got back together, you know, what was it, like eight years ago or something you now? And that's when we really started to find out, you know, what his life was all about. Yeah. So it must have been uh, exciting to be performing with Judge again because that, you know, that was one that I think a lot of people thought would never happen. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't think it would happen. It was almost, yeah. it was almost uh, miraculous. Right. It was really cool, though. I mean, we played those first shows, and they were packed. We sold out um, uh, this huge club in New York City two nights in a row. So it was 2,000 people there a night. You know, so it was, uh, it, was, it was cool to see that people still were super into the band. Now, Shelter, another classic band that you are in. Yes. Do you ever look at your resume and think like, wow, look at all this stuff I've done? Uh, you know, when you're in the band, you don't really think that way. But uh, I, I guess it, it, it's, it's cool. I'm, I'm, I'm happy that I put a lot of music out into the world. Yeah. I'm curious. So you were, you were already a devotee. Yeah. When the band started, right? You and Ray were you were already doing that. You had already been doing that. Yes. So you just we just wanted a more Krishna focused band. Well, you know, we figured punk rock was all about getting on stage and saying what was on your mind. You know, that's like the beauty of punk rock. You know, uh, you got something to say? Learn a few chords on guitar and get up there and say it. You know, you don't have to be a virtuoso. You don't have to be a great singer. You know, if you just have that you know, drive and energy to play music and you have something on your mind that you want to communicate to other people, that's punk rock. And so we figured we're into all this yoga type stuff. And why don't we get in a band and sing about it? <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. uh, that's exactly what we did. And, you know, we went out there, we, you know, it was very kind of, um, you know, spiritual band, you know, all the lyrics were based on spiritual principles from books like the Bhagavad Gita and, you know, other books from the Vedic literature. And it was a lot of the life lessons that we learned from living in temples and ashrams and studying yoga and learning how to meditate. And it was really cool. Like 
people thought this is kind of far out, but it's interesting. And I think a lot of people, uh, you know, embraced the band, even though we were kind of, I don't know if quirky is the right word or like out there kind of band, but the band became really big. I mean, it was crazy at the end, you know, how big we got. Yeah. I'm curious about that because Shelter has played some really big shows, stadiums. I think you guys were playing with No Doubt at some point and they're huge. Like, did your belief system ever conflict with working in the music business and performing? Because, you know, like concerts, sometimes there's women or drugs or alcohol. Not that you guys did any of that, but like, I mean, was it was it ever difficult operating in that world uh, with your belief system? Uh, not really. Not really. Because we kept a very tight knit group. And the thing is, you become like the people that you hang out with. So it's a lot harder if you're just, you know, by yourself and you're around a bunch of people who are, you know, indulging in like the rock star life. But if you have your crew and, you know, your crew is solid and they're, you know, they're not into that and they're into like a healthy lifestyle, it's not really that hard. That's why I see. That's why you really have to be careful who you hang out with because you become like the people that you hang out with. So you have to ch- you have to choose the people that you hang out with based on where do I want to be in life? Who do I want to be? Who em- embodies the qualities and values that I want to embody? Let me go hang out with them. And so the whole band was very much like that. Did anyone ever try to penetrate that group and be like, hey, I'm going to get shelter to do coke or, hey, uh, these girls want to meet up with us or anything like that? There, there was there was no way that shelter is going to do coke. I'll tell you that. Right? <laughs> I've never done coke, coke in my life. I'm not, you know, I'm not about to start or even back then. You know, the thought of doing coke would be so ridiculous to me that I would probably laugh. Yeah, it's uh it's it's not a necessary thing to do. I can I can tell you that. Yeah. I'll th- <laughs> I'll take your word for it. Yes, yes, take my word for it. Okay, Project X. You fronted this band. Yes. Were you not into fronting a band like you would rather play guitar cuz Project X had some steam. You could have kept rolling with that, right? Uh Project X was never really supposed to be a real band. Me and the guitar player from Gorilla Biscuits, um, Alex Brown, were doing a fanzine called Schism Fanzine. And we wanted to put a record in the fanzine. And so we were going around to like, we, we, at first we were thinking, we'll just do a compilation and we'll get like a Youth of the Day song, we'll get Gorilla Biscuits to record, and we'll put this little you know, compilation EP in the zine. But every band was, was getting ready to record a whole album. You know, so they didn't have any free songs to just give away, you know, on a free record in a fanzine. So we yeah. we just decided, let's make our own band. <laughs> <laughs> we got together, we practiced like we we practiced like once and we wrote all the song at that like one practice. And then we went in and we recorded it for like 25 bucks or whatever. So it was never really in- intended to be a real band. It was just wild. Like when that record came out, Kids were super into it. Like if you were a straight edge kid, and I think it was because of the song Straight Edge Revenge. And the lyrics to Straight Edge Revenge are, I'm as straight as the line that you snip up your nose. I'm as, um, as hard as the booze that you swill down your throat. I'm as bad as the shit that you breathe into your lungs, and I'll fuck you up as fast as the pill on your tongue. <laughs> That's like the whole lyric. <laughs> you know, even though I don't promote violence, I'm not into violence. I'm, Living, I'm like a live and let live type person. But I think when you're straight edge, and, and this was my experience, and a lot of people who are straight edge have experienced the exact same thing. As soon as you tell people, I'm not going to drink or party anymore, people start to really get on your case. What's wrong with you? What are you? Soft. Um, you know, people stop hanging out with you. People call you names. People, you know, berate you. I don't know what it is in, 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 human in the human psyche that when a person tries to uplift themselves and you're not ready to uplift yourself, then you want to attack and criticize that person. <laughs> I don't know if it it's makes odd. you feel bad about yourself because you know you're involved in things that aren't in your best interest. I don't know what it is. So when I became straight edge and even like in the beginning of youth today, you know, people were, oh you straight edge, freaking assholes, fuck you, fuck straight edge. 
So I think at one time or another, every person that's straight has just kind of felt like that. Like, hey, this is my life. These are my choices. If you don't like it, fuck you. <laughs> Which is basically, you know, the gist of the song. So when that song came out and when that record came out, kids just went nuts over it. You know, and we played a few shows and every single time we play that, that song, Straight as Revenge, oh my God, the place would go nuts. Somehow or other, it just would strike a chord in every single straight edge kid, you know, from all the, you know, shit that they would take from other people for their, just for wanting to live a better life. Jesus. (laughs) (laughs) Imagine. (laughs) Yeah. Well, I know we're out of time, but uh, poor Cell, I mean, uh, look, you've done a lot. You're still doing a lot. I really appreciate uh, all the music you've given us. So I just wanted to say... Thank you so much for coming on the show. All right. Thank you for the interview. One last thing is I want to say is uh, the Values Here album comes out tomorrow. Or no, it comes out on Friday. So September 22nd, our full album is going to be released with 13 songs. I'm really proud of it and excited to have everyone hear these songs and go on tour and start playing shows. So please check out that record. Um, and please look for us. We're going to be touring a lot um, in the near future. And I hope to see all you guys at, at a show. And there you have it. Poor Cell. Wow. Excellent, excellent conversation. Another person who has just done everything, everything. Look at all of the bands he's done. Unbelievable stuff. My only wish is that I had more time with him, but he was doing back-to-back interviews. But look at, you know, there's a lot of great stories in that. Super interesting hearing about the advent of the straight edge scene and how that wasn't even a thing, really, when Youth of Today got started and the craziness of New York City and the Lower East Side and the 80s and 90s, and just so many classic bands, too. Everything he has done has been a home run. Great stuff. Great, great stuff. Thank you so much, Porcel, for coming on the show. So let's check in, huh? How are we doing? I have been very busy this past week. Here's a run. Oh, here's a, here's a continuation of what was going on last week. Now, I told you I went to the quicksand slip event at Generation Records, and there was panel speakers and all that good stuff. And then later that night, I had the opportunity to go to the quicksand slip show at Webster Hall. I met up there with Casey from Iodine, and it was one of the best quicksand performances I've ever seen. Slip is a top three of all time record for me. Super influential in my life. Something I've continued to listen to until this day. So to watch them play that whole record was great. Was great. And you know what? I Before I said, uh, I don't think I've ever seen Quicksand with Brodsky on guitar. I think I have at Furnace Fest in 2022. I'm pretty sure he was on guitar at that show. But it's just amazing to have Steven Brodsky in the band too. But unbelievable performance. One of the best times I've ever seen them. I was super happy that day and that night. You know, I feel like I'm getting back to pre-COVID me. Believe it or not, before COVID, I used to go to a lot more shows. I used to go to a lot of shows by myself. I was constantly listening to music. And then COVID happened and I got sucked into the world of gaming and YouTube and Twitch and content creators and all this stuff. The podcast went full time, so that took up a lot of time. And I feel like it's shifting back now to a more healthier balance because there's other gigs I went to this week, which I will talk about now. Friday night, Heavy Psych Sounds Fest, day one at St. Vitus. A lot of great bands playing, and my good friends in Ecstatic Vision played direct support for Bongzilla. Now, I didn't get there until close to nine o'clock because I had some other stuff going on, but I got there in time for Ecstatic Vision. And let me tell you something, they continue to surprise me live. I've seen them a ton of times, but they were just unbelievable, 
unbelievably good. They put on one of the best live shows out of anybody. Out of anybody. So if you have the opportunity to go see them, please do so. Lots of fun. I got really pumped up during the set. And of course, it was great to see Doug and Mike and the whole band. Good to catch up. Good to be out, hanging out, doing things. Good stuff. Oh, and Bongzilla headline. Now, the sludgier stoner metal sound. It is not my go-to music. However, Bongzilla sounded massive. Massive. And they had some serious grooves going on. Uh, It was really cool. It was really cool to see and to hear. So another great night there. Saturday, worked on the show all day, did some research for some upcoming guests, and then back to Webster Hall Saturday night to see Botch. This is their first tour in, what, 20 years? I've been anticipating this one. Uniform opened the show. I caught half of their set. That was my first time seeing them. Very good stuff. And Botch. Now, I had not seen Botch since their tour with Dillinger Escape Plan, and I think that was in 1999. We Are the Romans had just come out. I saw them at the first Unitarian Church sometime in 1999. Maybe it was 1998. I can't remember, but I wasn't as familiar with the band then as I am now. And they were everything that I hoped for and more. Just unbelievably good. The singer, Dave, just seemed super stoked to be there and was jump down to like shake hands and interact with the crowd before and after the set. And the vibes were good. The set was unbelievable. They sounded unbelievably tight. It was also the loudest show I've ever been to. I took out my earplug at one point just to hear what it sounded like raw. And it was so unbelievably loud. If I had gone to that show without earplugs, I'd probably be deaf right now or have permanent tinnitus. So bring ear protection. But wow, they played every song you would want to hear and more. And it was just flawless. Flawless. Super happy that I went to that. And that was my weekend. It's Sunday now. I'm gearing up for another week. I'm going to be in Maryland this week for work, and I'm not happy about that. But listen, sometimes you got to do it. I just got to get through this last grind week at work, and then I'll have off the week of Thanksgiving. And I'm really looking forward to that. I'm going to kick back, watch some movies, play some video games, just really relax, really, really relax, which I thought I would have a lot of time to do once I got back from that last tour, but it's been pretty busy and there's been a lot of stuff going on, but I'm looking forward to some downtime. All right, so let's move into the new scene community hour. We've got new messages. We've got new reviews. We need to hear from our community. So let's start off with some Spotify Q&A first. We have one from Simon about episode 189 with Marshall Gallagher from Teenage Wrist. Simon says, this is what I love about the show. By connecting with the artist, you gain a greater understanding of their journey and what inspired them during the creation process. Thank you, Simon. That's Simon Downbeat Vinyl right there, everybody. And yes, that was one of my favorites. Marshall, super nice person, and Teenage Wrist put out an excellent LP this year. It's called Still Love. Check it out. Denny had this to say about episode 200 with George Clark from Death Heaven. Denny says, loved the episode. I almost had a heart attack at the part where George talks about people getting their lyrics tattooed because I'm one of those people. Thanks for the great conversation. Thank you, Denny, for that comment. Yes. There's been a lot of fanfare about the George Clark interview. Really happy I got to do that one. Deaf Heaven, one of my favorite bands of the last 10 years for sure. Here's another comment about the George Clark episode. Heath Gibson says, fantastic episode. Go give a listen. Guess I'm going to have to dive into this discography. Thank you, Heath. Now, you know what that comment tells me? That comment tells me that Heath listens to the show even if he doesn't necessarily know the artist. And yes, Heath, go and dive into the Deaf Heaven discography because there is not a single miss in it, and the records are just fantastic. Heath has been a longtime supporter of the show. He's in a band called Enduring Reverie, and they put out an LP this year called Carrier, 
Check it out. It's like melodic, metal, kind of an ISIS vibe going on at times. Give it a listen. And we've got new Apple Podcast reviews. Okay, let's get into this. We have a review from Righty Frizzle. Five stars. Keith M. brings the heat. The new scene is my favorite pod to have on while cruising in the car or just chilling at home. I really appreciate the production value that goes into each episode. Thank you, Keith, for these absolute winners. Thank you, Frank. I think that's the guy I met at the quicksand event. Frank. Yes, Frank, shout out to you and thank you for the review. Here's another one from John D. Love the show. Five stars. I always enjoy the interviews and thanks for the mention. That's John DiGiorgio right there. John, thank you for the review. And listen, keep those reviews coming. We need more. Now we've gotten over the hump on Spotify. We're at 203. And I thank you everybody who hit that five star button. But we've got a long way to go on Apple Podcasts. We sit at 148. And we need to get to 200. So listen, if you want to support the show, this is a great way to do it that does not take a lot of time. Open up your iPhone, navigate to the podcast app, search the new scene, scroll down, hit the five star button. And if you write a review, I'll read it on the air right here during the new scene community hour. So that's it for this week. That's all I've got. We are going to end with our music recommendation for this week which is a band I got into when I first got into this music. It is a band who put out their greatest record in 1999. It is a band called Turmoil. Now, they put out this record, The Process Of, in 1999, and it still sounds completely modern and fresh today. It has not aged a minute, and it is a highly, highly influential album to this day. I know Greg from End said that this band and this record specifically are an inspiration and you can really hear it when you listen to end and it sounds as fresh and awesome and heavy and brutal today as it did when it came out way back in 1999 so we will end the show with let it die by turmoil i'll add the song to the new scene 2023 spotify playlist go and find the playlist on spotify follow it I put all of our guests there. I put all of my recommendations there. And listen to the process of. It's an all-time classic. I'm back next week with a new episode and a new guest. So thanks everybody for listening. And until next time.